So we're gonna we're going to um, have our panel next, and um, James Lundemer is going to be back with us, and as is Sharifa Crandall and Carolee Bull, who is standing in for John Pecchia. Um, so thank you, Carolee, for doing that on short notice. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is let the panelists do an introduction of themselves and a little bit about their research. So Sharif, I'd like to start with you. Um, so hello, everybody. Oh, I also played trumpet once upon a time, so I can <laughs> project, but I will use this. So hello, everybody. My name is Sharifa Crandall, and I'm an assistant professor in the plant pathology and environmental microbiology department. And I have a background in fungal ecology and plant pathology. And so currently, um, my lab is about soil borne pathogens. And I also work with those elusive endophytes. Hopefully, we have a chance to talk a little bit more about them today. And um, I think that's, that's good. So my name is Carolee Bull, and I, I serve as the head of the Department of Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology that you've all heard so much about today. Um, and I work closely with John Pecchia, who is the director of the Mushroom um, Research Facility on campus. It's a, it's a um, unique facility. There are only two publicly funded facilities like this in the world. And this is really uh, an amazing facility. The kind of work that has come out of there has helped to make, in fact, the Pennsylvania mushroom industry uh, leaders in uh, the country as well as uh, in the world in, in many ways. Um, they're primarily working with agaricus production, but John is very interested in exotic mushrooms as well. Um, and yeah, I think that's, uh, uh, maybe what I'll say about that. The, the um, organization is funded by both endowments from the mushroom industry, but also um, I think since 2014, uh, as a group, we've had multi-million dollar grants continuously. And so we just wrote another one last weekend. And so let's, let's hope that one gets funded. Um, my, my particular role in, in working with the mushroom industry or with mushrooms is I'm a uh, phytobacteriologist. I work on diseases caused by bacteria um, on mushrooms or plants in particular. Um, I do a little bit of bacterial taxonomy and what I say is, is translational taxonomy, understanding what the organisms are and then using that information to strategize management strategies based on their ecology and other, other factors. All right, thank you, Sharifa and Kara Lee. Um, James, we've already met you, but would you like to say a word or two about, how, about your path, maybe? Uh, sure. Um, my, uh, so I'm James Lendemer. I am an associate curator here at the New York Botanical Garden and uh, assistant professor at the City University of New York. And so my research mostly focuses on sort of biodiversity and ecology in all its forms of lichens. Um, and, and really, I've spent my career trying to understand what they are, why they are there, and why they are and are not where they are. Um, and really, in my work and my students' work and that of my collaborators has really, you know, runs the gamut from everything from population genetics and genomics to descriptive taxonomy and ecology, macroecology, all sorts of things. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a person with like and expertise and, and sort of I work with other people who know things about other things to make the world a better place. <laughs> oh, great, um, James, I'm just gonna do a little PR thing for you right here, right now. Um, do you wanna say about, among your many works, um, you wrote a book called We did. You're right. I was going to have him air sign it. But he's gone. Oh, right. Oh, good. Yes. Excellent. So, James, I've, I've brought a copy of your book, and it's in the back of the room. And I was going to ask you to air sign it. But um, then I'll have to maybe. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much. Yay. OK. Um, great. So I am a microbiologist in the geoscience department. And so that's my one of my hats and my other hat is as the Ecology Institute Director. So I'm bringing both of my hats today 
in addition to a third hat, which is um, that I direct the Astrobiology Center on campus. And so I am, um, in many ways, I think of myself as a planetary ecologist, um, hopefully not the dying type, if you've been watching Dune lately, um, in which a planetary ecologist famously dies. Um, anyway, I feel perfectly safe um, in my role as planetary ecologist. So what, I, what we want to do here in this panel is be, be, continue to be very freewheeling. And so I'm asking the audience to, to um, participate by asking questions. I do have a bunch of questions here, but I'd much rather have the questions come from you all um, in the, on the Zoom and in the room. Um, and so I think one of the goals that I have for this panel is to try to assess the promise and also the challenges associated with using fungi in association or combination with other organisms. And so we're really focusing on these interactions that could remove frictions or add frictions. Um, and you know, we're starting from this place of reductionist science where we like to have things in isolation, including microbial cultures. And, um, but we now have these new tools for interrogating how biological systems work without isolating the components first. And so we really want to um, talk about you know, progress and the promise and the challenges of, of doing that. OK, so I actually had a few words. And so I know it's been a long day. And so you know, I'll keep this very concise. Sometimes I think it's nice to maybe have like three take home messages, maybe, you know, at least from me. I don't know. I'm sure there are a lot that you, you can take home today. And so this has to do with, with when you think about fungi and their ecology. Okay. And when you're thinking about making those links between um, fungi and biomaterials. And so, sort of these three things are sort of a framework. Or at least my framework of how I think about it. An example, and then making a link or multiple links. Okay, so the first thing, first take home, the framework. So a lot of my work with fungal ecology is trying to understand fungi across time and space, and in particular, their biology and their traits. And I'm sure you've all studied you know, traits in general about maybe humans before or other organisms, but fungal traits in particular, I think are important within as a framework, you know, when you're, when you're trying to think about biomaterials downstream. So what are fungal traits? Does anybody know or have any ideas from the audience maybe? What's a fungal trait? Yeah. Ah, that it procreates and spread absolutely dispersal, re reproduction, absolutely. Traits is a broad term, right? Yeah. Oh, the answer on Zoom, what is it? Absolutely. Sometimes it's nice to think of these traits as phenotypic or, you know, maybe the color of spores that allow them to deal with, you know, lots of UV light, right? They actually have melanin, believe it or not, or not just like us, okay, in our skin, so do fungi. Um, and so it's very interesting to think about traits because when you have those genetic traits, you can also study those and you can study maybe their function as well, right? So, again, to just to think for yourselves, if you're interested in biomaterials, sort of what is it that you're interested in downstream and what are those functions, right? That, you know, James was alluding to earlier that are sort of ubiquitous among certain types of fungi, perhaps closely related fungi. Um, some fungi are very good, most, some, not most, but some are very good at degrading lignin, for example, right? breaking down wood. If it wasn't for that trait, we'd be knee deep, okay, <laughs> in leaf litter and logs, you know, <laughs> but the fungi help us with that. Okay, so that's that framework. So just think about those, those traits, some of which are functional traits, genotypic, phenotypic, 
Okay, so what could be an example? Because remember, this conference is also about those interactions between organisms. It's not just about fungi sort of in a vacuum. Okay, so here comes at least a great example in my mind, because it's something I'm working on with a bunch of colleagues here at Penn State. And it's this idea of endophytes. Okay, so what is an endophyte? Does anybody have an idea? No? Okay, that's okay. It's okay if you don't know what, but you've probably heard this word kicked around a little, at least today, right? <laughs> yes, and people on Zoom are probably like, yep. Okay, so in this room, we actually have a real expert on endophytes, you know, Dr. <laughs> Maria Del Mar, who is Gasco, she's in the back. So if you have any questions, she's been thinking about endophytes for years and her research is really on that. And I'm just beginning to do this in my career. But endophytes are, fungal endophytes are fungi. Endo means inside, phyte typically means plant, but we'll also say they can also live inside of, they're like endosymbionts can also live inside a lichen too. Fungal endophytes, okay, are so interesting because they have so many functions that, um, oh, and by the way, they typically live inside a plant, but they typically do not cause harm, okay? Typically do not. An endophyte can transform into a pathogen. And that's interesting too, right? So to wrap this up, because I don't want to take too much time, I think when you think about an example of like maybe where we can think about functions, these fungal endospites, some people have shown, you know, and there's actual research here in, plant, in the plant literature, for example, that fungal endospites help deter herbivory. That's a big deal if you're thinking about crops, right? And maybe you could select for endophytes that live inside a corn leaf or a strawberry, maybe, I don't know, that help deter insects, you know, because they create these secondary metabolites that you've been hearing about, like in, in alkaloids that, you know, insects think are nasty. Okay, so interesting, right? So that's my example. And then the third thing are the links, right? So this is where you all come in. So you can think about, you know, our buscular mycorrhizae can sometimes have an endophytic form, especially when they have, you know, part of them are inside a root. How can we then use that? And people have been thinking about and trying to use um, mycorrhizae, for example, with plant roots for phytoremediation and things like that. How could you then use that to create certain types of materials? I don't know because I'm a couple degrees separated from <laughs> bio bioengineering, but that's you know where you all come in. So those are the sort of three things I wanted to talk about. Thank you, Sharifa. And uh, just um, can you can I ask you to follow up on that? Um, can you define endophyte and and contrast that with the term mycorrhizae? Absolutely. Okay. So an endophyte is a fungal endophyte. I'll be specific because there are bacterial endophytes too. But here we're talking about fungi. So is a fungus that lives symbiotically with the plant and does not cause harm to the plant. And it's, I'll tell you the frontier of science right now because you know, we're learning about their functions. Sometimes they're sitting there like, we don't know what you're doing. And you can learn about it through microbiome work, metagenomics, things like that. Mycorrhizae, okay, are a type of fungus, okay? And they often associate with roots and they help increase the surface area of the roots. Think of a sleeve on your arm. The sleeve would be the mycorrhizae and your arm would be the root. And it would help you sequester things like water and phosphorus. Okay, and in return, the mycorrhizae have a home, you know, so, so it's very cool. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship, but it's specifically a mutualism, okay? Some mycorrhizae can be endosymbiotic, but there can be free living fungal endophytes living inside of plants that we just don't even know what their functions are. Maria, did you wanna add anything to that? Okay, thanks, Jen. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sharifa. So I'm gonna um, walk around because I'm antsy. Um, um, 
so I want to bring this back around to biomaterials, bio uh, fungal building materials. And I'm going to ask the panel and the room, really, um, whether or not it's realistic to imagine. We're going to start at the very beginning here, very simple. Whether it's reasonable to imagine a fungal building material with a fungal co-culture. So we're talking about a, a plant. That we, so we're discounting the plant, by the way, which has made the substrate. And now I'm just asking, you know, is a material that's made out of two different fungi potentially better than one that is made out of just a single fungus? Carolee, I can see you. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. I, I'd just like to talk a little bit about what we know about fungi, because I, I think you actually can't get something that isn't more than one organism to be a building material. Yeah. And so um, James loves th that answer. So if I if I um, will tell you a little bit about what we know about producing mushrooms. So mushroom production is um, done in a controlled environment in it could be in a room this big, if you like, um, where uh, specifically composted materials that are composted using um, a two-tiered process or three-tiered process, depending upon how you want to think about it, um, to really get the materials in the right state, having the right microbial ecology that produces the organisms and um, that produces the fruiting bodies. Uh, just an example, those um, microbes are necessary for producing fruiting bodies. If you sterilize the compost, you would not get fruiting bodies, okay? And there are... Um, organisms, Pseudomonas, which is one of my favorite bugs, that in fact um, will degrade toxins that are produced in the mycelium that prevent mushrooms for, from growing close together. So if it, it's producing this toxin, that toxin um, will reduce the a number of mushroom fruiting bodies that you get, but the Pseudomonas breaks it down so the mushrooms can, can fruit close together. Okay. So there is a necessary um, set of microbiome uh, dynamics that happen that allow fruiting body formation. And the area, and I'm, I'm gonna just say the area of work that John and I and Kevin Hockett and Fabricio and Owen O'Connor are working on, uh, Rachel started working with us too, is on the concept of micro, micro um, uh, developmental microbiomes. And in particular with, with mushrooms, there's going to be that. So you can imagine that these interactions between the mycelium and the bacteria, the mycelium with other mycelium are, um, are happening continually and that there are microbial signals for growth and development. And so you may want a certain microbial signal to keep things from fruiting you don't, might not want fruiting bodies hanging off of your structures, or you might want them, depending <laughs> on what it is. And so I, I personally think, and, and I'll just say, you know, as, as the current director of the Microbiome Center, you know, I think that looking at what it is you want and then looking at the microbial community to help you get it from a community standpoint is really, is really the frontier. That's that a very exciting, question. very exciting answer. Kind of did, but I, I have more questions. So um, you, you're saying that to get fruiting bodies, you have to have a, a bacterium that is cleaning up the waste so that you can have dense fruiting. That's in that system. Right, so, in that system. So, so in hearing you talk, that made me think about something else. Could I have, so by the way, no one's answered my first question. Yeah, we'll get yeah. there. So if someone has an answer, just chime in. So should it be in co-culture is what you're saying? What I'm saying is, do we know enough about mycelium to understand whether or not a co-culture could be, have better material properties? I think the answer is no, but I'm just, I'm asking the question. Okay, we don't know. Okay, here's my next question. Could you have, now I'm thinking about carbon cycle. Could you have a material in which you have a photobiont or a phototroph that's harvesting sunlight? Because really, here I am, the planetary ecologist. That is the only really actually sustainable source of energy is the star. So the starlight is, at, you know, ideally, we would, we would incorporate an organism that can harvest starlight. 
can you have, so now this is like, can you make a lichen? Can you have a bacterium that's making cellulose from glucose that's made by the cyanobacterium that is then, you know, turned into um, a, a, a building material that's bound together by the, by the fungus? Like, can we make, could we make that? Any reason why we could not make that? I, I would guess that there are combinations like that that exist in nature that we haven't looked at. And that's primarily because we, as you said, we've studied individual organisms, we've isolated them, put them on petri dishes, and look what they do in that artificial system, right? But there are all different kinds, there are so many different kinds of interactions, and we are just be, beginning to piece them apart, right? Right, and so, right. So I guess to be even more sort of blunt, um, would, would NSF fund someone to go try sticking bacteria and archaea and, and algae together with the focus on building materials? Or is that just too far out? Is that too far ahead? You know, I, I love the idea because it's very sci-fi, I mean, right? I mean, but I wonder, because a scientist in me is like, too many variables. <laughs> So because we know, especially with fungi or even fungi or even lichen, that you have to be very careful because if you change the environment in any way, that can change the substrate, it can change their reproductive, their reproduction, you know, they're alive, you know, they're just not a piece of plastic, right? So um, it's very hard to predict. I think it's more interesting to think about what happens here on earth, maybe not as much in the Petri plate anymore because we know what happens in the Petri plate, right? But to make predictions based on these communities, how they might respond to extreme temperatures, to extreme environments, you know, and then to environments that aren't as extreme and how that might affect aha, their traits. <laughs> traits, the communal traits, but also the traits individually. I think that would be interesting, but you might want to focus on a couple things. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Can I go ahead? Or? Go, James. Oh, sorry. I, don't, I wasn't sure if you could see my little hand raised. <laughs> so, you know, I... I, I do think actually there's a lot of work that is being done on replicating the a lot of the attributes that we have from the lichen symbiosis because really you know a lot of the stability and a lot of the properties in terms of stability and and you know I guess in the case of of generating energy or what have you from from algae you know a lot of that is sort of what the lichens are designed to do they're kind of unique in a lot of those ways. And so there is actually a lot of research that's being done actively on trying to sort of create de novo, you know, synthesize like and like structures, right? Biofilms and all sorts of stuff like that. But the other thing is that, you know, these, these organisms are already doing these things. And the, the thing that we are at the moment on the verge of, I would, I would argue on the verge of trying, of understanding is sort of the actual basis for allowing that symbiosis to happen, allowing the, um, you know, it, it's the, we, we kind of understand the, the pathways involved in signaling for whether or not something is a compatible or not compatible, you know, associate a member a partner or something like that. But, but I, I you know, I really think that it, once we can, once we figure out especially across a broad sampling of species, because remember lichens are not, they're a lifestyle, right? They're not a monophyletic group. So it's a lifestyle that's arisen independently, been gained and lost multiple times in numerous groups of fungi. So the question is sort of, are all these different fungi that are not necessarily related to each other, are they arriving at their relationship with these algae or, you know, whatever their associates in the same molecular manner, or is it different? And, and can we then use that to manipulate a system to build what we want? Um, and I, I really don't think that's that far away, at least in terms of characterization. You know, we have the technology to characterize these things. It's the expression and, and doing things in other systems. That's, that's the challenge. Thank you, James. Um, if I could just ask you to add on, is that being done in academia or in industry or where is that work taking place? 
my, to my knowledge, that's in academia. I don't know of anything that's being done in industry so much. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a question back here, so I want to um, um, let this person speak, and then we'll take more questions as they come. I was actually just going to comment on your question about the consortium. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie. Um, so right now at the Curtis Lab here in chemical engineering, there's consortia, like the one that you're describing, but for biofuels. Um, and I think that the, the question becomes, can you have things that grow well together with their requirements and on the same time scale? Because mushrooms, um, you know, the mycelia will uh, propagate, I guess, at a certain time scale. And if you have a bacteria that's trying to also live in the same consortia, it needs to, you know, have the same like oxygen, carbon availability requirements, whatever, so that they can work together. Um, so the one, the problem with the, um, or rather what the biofuel question is answering is clostridium is uh, breaking down cellulose and lignin in straw and then an algae is taking those simpler sugars and converting it into oil that can be used for biofuel. So if we could do something similar to that where we have bacteria breaking down the hay or whatever and then also making the mycelial building blocks, like I think there's, there's a lot of work being done in biofuels that could maybe be applied to biomaterials. Wonderful comment. Thank you very much, Katie. Katie? Katie. Yeah. Okay. We have multiple questions. Oh, James, you still have your hand raised. Is it newly raised? Yeah, I was just going to reply to that kind of with, you know, I think one of the interesting things, again, is that using these these lichens as a system, you know, they've kind of already done that, right? They've evolved ways to essentially shut down the physiological activity and manage the physiological activity of the other organisms that are inside of them. Um, so they are, you know, physiologically inactive as are all the things inside of them as much as they can be for protracted periods of time. And then they become active at certain periods. Um, and so in a lot of, and knowing how, knowing, the requirements that they need to become physiologically active, you could control that and you certainly could manipulate that to your advantage. Um, so, you know, using lichens themselves or the ways that they have devised to do that with these, for these other organisms, you know, like that, that is some, that is a solution that in some ways has been solved, <laughs> at least in nature. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear about that in other fungal systems because I, I don't know very much about that beyond my corner of the universe. <laughs> All right, thanks, James. Um, Benet? I was gonna, hi everybody, my name's Nick. Um, I was gonna circulate back to the first question about a coal culture uh, when we're doing like biomaterials. Um, so my experience is with agaricus also, as Carly talked about. And um, if you look through like the growing of agaricus, there is a coal culture the whole time with bacteria, but also with fungi. Um, but that's a secondary decomposer, whereas the biomaterial fungi that you guys are proposing to use uh, is a primary. So I guess you would have to find a symbiont or somebody that would work well with that type of fungi in order to uh, do a culture like that. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, Nick. Can I? Not really a question, but maybe we talked about compartmentalization in science, like how we study one thing at a time. I think when we make our own, we make our materials, fungal biomaterials, the problem is like we start by sterilizing everything. The substrate is sterilized, making sure that nothing else is living there. And then we move to the growth room. I mean, in our practice, it's in the Mushroom Research Center, the growth rooms that are clean and sterilized where we inoculate that clean material with the fungi species that we want. And the goal is to make sure that only that fungi species grows and it, like colonies, colonizes that substrate. But certain times, you know, there are other uh, environmental fungi in the room that, you know, typically tri uh, trichoderma can, you know, enter the substrate. And when there's the contamination, there's no uh, mycelial, I mean, there can be mycelial growth, but there's an ecosystem and there's a fight in that substrate. And one, the reason why we wanted to have this panel is exactly to discuss these, like, can we make biomaterials by creating an ecosystem instead of relying on one single fungal species? And can that also help maybe uh, fight against mold? So can we find symbionts that will help the fungi thrive, but, you know, also fight against 
um, the other fungi species. So I know also that there are few studies in the literature um, that explore how we can, by creating, by combining different um, uh, living organisms. Again, I'm an architect, so <laughs> I'm just trying to understand all this literature too. There, there are also studies that explore how like creating a heterogeneous um, system can how, can result in like higher mechanical strength, for instance, not just relying on one type of fungi, but a combination, but there are very few at this moment, but I, I, I definitely see a potential um, there. So I wanted to hear what you guys think. I mean, you already said what you think, but I just wanted to give that perspective. Yeah. No, uh, Thanks, so Benet. Go ahead, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll take a stab at answering that. Great. So, so Benet, actually, you, this would be a perfect experiment to look at as you're growing. So I, I would guess that your materials are not sterile. I would guess that um, sometimes you have a pathogen of your fungus that comes in, but probably you have bacteria and fungi co-cultured with that, um, even though you've tried to be sterile, just because of the nature of what you're doing. And there, there's actually funding in the microbiome center that you could apply for. It's called Give a Dog a Bone, um, $5,000 of sequencing that you could do some sequencing to see who's there. Okay. And then the microbiome center through their dog, because you're given the dog a bone, their data analysis working group would actually help you analyze that so that you could figure out who's there. And then the question is, can you manipulate that to actually either make it stronger, make it grow faster, inhibit the trichoderma that's killing your, your mushroom, um, uh, material. So I, I think there are lots of questions related to what you're doing now. The, the more difficult piece is where do we even begin to think about combining different organisms? I would say you start in nature and you start looking at, um, you could look at microbiomes of the kinds of organisms that you are um, trying to culture in a sterile environment and see who, are, who is it who. What, what organisms are associated with them? There's some who's in there, but what organisms are associated with them? And that would be your, I think that's your, that would be the place I would start. And that is NSF funded. There are companies that produce um, mycelium-based materials in like industry, industries that produce mycelium-based composites, but they don't really disclose um, the, the mixture. But I know, I mean, I don't know, but I heard from someone that um, their, their compositions are also not homogeneous. They were able to um, backtrack what's inside and found that there are yeast, different types of yeast working together with the fungi, resulting in faster growth, and like re more resistance against mold. I just wanted to say that, but I think, you know, that's um, I next, like that's what's needed to take these research also to the next level. And, and there's some resources for you here on campus. Great, that's great to hear. Sharifa, were you gonna chime in? I was just gonna say that I think it's also important to think a little bit about sort of, you know, like the method in terms of, you know, you're saying you want to create an ecosystem, right? And um, sometimes you can look to ecological theory for that. And you can say that, you know, I, you know, you have all these different, you have a yeast, you have some bacteria in there, you have some fungi in your mix, whatever it is, you know, that you're trying to work with. And, um, you know, it might be very difficult, for example, to mimic what's in nature, if you're going to, and you should start with me, I think you should definitely start with nature. But the cool thing is that, um, all organisms, I mean, have functions and they have, there's this concept of functional redundancy where certain functions you can find in different organisms and some organisms are easier to grow than others. So, and you can take either a phylogenetic approach where you look at closely related organisms. And the idea is that sister taxa or like, think about your own families. You probably look more like your parents than your friend looks like your parents right? <laughs> because you're related. And the same thing with organisms, they'll have those traits. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. 
<laughs> it's a good example. You won't forget it, right? But the, so, and so we can have these, you know, if you're looking for, you know, lignin degradation again, just as your function, maybe there's certain organisms that grow really fast, they're very common, and that work well with others in your ecosystem. And so that is part of the selection process you would want to put into a grant, I would think, you know, like how you screen, because the screening is like the hardest part. Right. Thank you, Sharifa. I'm going to return to screening in just a moment if we have time. But in the meantime, let's let's take a question from the chat. Question from the chat. Again, related to mold. Can the alkaloids that endophytes create help deter mold growth? Could the gene from these endophytes be transferred to white rot fungi through genetic engineering? I'm so excited about the idea of you giving a dog a bone. <laughs> Okay, the question is, can the alkaloids that endophytes create help deter mold growth? Could the gene from these endophytes be transferred to white rot fungi through genetic engineering? Um, I think, uh, could they? Yes. Uh, would they be safe? Who knows, right? It depends what alkaloids you're talking about. So, so um, whether you'd want to or not is another question if it's for a food product, right? If it's not for a food product, that's, that's a different kind of question. Mm -hmm. Did that answer that? <laughs> I, I already sent you the email. It's a, the grant is due on the 15th. It's short. <laughs> it's so nice. All right. All right. We're going to, we're going to get, we're going to get Benet hooked up with dog. Absolutely. Dog bone. We're going to get the dog a bone. Okay. Um, I, I, we are going to, at what time do we, are we going to adjourn? 5.15, I think. is. So we have a few more minutes, 12 or so, um, to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, and so I encourage you to ask whatever kinds of questions you might have. And if um, you don't, I have a whole list. So don't think you're going to leave if you don't have a question. You're here for the duration. Could I just talk about the developmental microbiomes? So, Ab absolutely. So, so um, Monica Medina, who is in biology, organized a, um, uh, a group of people to think about writing an NSF grant. And we did. We wrote a pre-proposal um, for an NSF center. Yeah. And um, it's so people looking at developmental microbiomes for all different kinds of things, everything from jellyfish she works on to fungi, which uh, Fabricio and, and a bunch of us were involved in, and then um, mixobacteria that are developmental organisms, lots of different things across the kingdoms, right? So this is a fundamental, um, what role do microorganisms have in development throughout the, the uh, tree of life, right? And so when we're thinking about materials, this is, this is one of those keys I think that, that we need to think about is what, and Benet is trying to get at that, but what is it, if you're trying to grow a material, what are those organisms that are gonna give you the right consortium? Um, I think it's the same question you're asking, but that fundamental question about, are there developmental microbiomes or things that um, increase growth and development? In addition to, you know, just saying what consortium would, would allow them to be sustainable by feeding themselves, just thinking what are the organisms that are involved in, yeah, just allowing them to grow. It's, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to see Monica bring that group back, that rock band for a second try just because it's, uh, we, we got good at singing, but we maybe we weren't playing the drums quite so well. Any other questions or? You're also welcome to email us or set up a time. I'm, I'm totally <laughs> volunteering Dr. Bull <laughs> and <Yeah>. James. <laughs> Sharifa, you had started there too. Um, 
to you know bio-based materials and composites right um that's where i'm coming from as a mechanical engineer and material scientist and there's uh something that i heard multiple times starting with this morning and then uh you know from elise and then tamash james mentioned it and then you when you talked about the three um uh, i don't think you call them pillars that was tamash forgot what you call them but you talked about framework example making a link which i love and you picked up again on this thread which is the function right if we can't use the thing uh and i'm paraphrasing james you know think of using the function uh it is basically what we talk about uh, you know as engineers when we're talking about multifunctional composites right so when we're talking about multifunction composite, we have our ecosystem, which is multiple materials that are coming together that we're forcing, forcing them to be together when we fabricate them. They don't necessarily want to be together. They wouldn't normally, uh, you know, uh, uh, connect uh, uh, and, and give us good properties if we didn't force them through chemical means to do that. So the reason I'm saying all this to say, you know, getting back to bringing multiple fungi, you know, together or fungi and bacteria, et cetera, if in some ecosystem, we can we have these multiple species types together where, you know, I would like one of them or two to be, um, you know, capable of being activated so that they can feast on the other material at end of life, for example, that's their function. Their function is eating the whole thing and breaking it down uh, so that we are truly sustainable, you know, at end of life. Uh, and then a couple of them are actually what are what is going to help this ecosystem uh, and help their friends grow and, and give us, you know, a dense material that is able to have good mechanical properties. I love that. OK, so here's an idea. So when you were talking, I was thinking, wow, we have to think about if you want, you said you, you make the materials work together through chemical means. So how could you do that with a bunch of microbes <laughs> and fungi? Maybe you could modulate the environment. You could change time and space. Time is you introduce them at different times and space is you compartmentalize them maybe within a lichen maybe into something else i don't know how but just thinking about how you modulate the environment such that you know these microbes can interact but remember microbes are fickle things so you know because they're alive so you can't always predict what they're going to do unlike you know a dead i'm sorry but true dead material you know <laughs> but it's not a lot non-alive material so I don't know, I just thought of that, but, but, but at least it's a starting point to think about modulating the environment. I don't know, what do you think? I'll say that's one of, that's one of the other pieces. And I think, I think James got at it in his, his uh, presentation. And I really appreciated you talking about uh, colonization and time and space, right? That's, it's an important piece of what we do. Uh, um, so, for example, Benet, for your work, do you um, do you add your inoculum all at once? Do you do it? Do you do it in one place and hope it grows in a direction? Do you inoculate across? All of those things could have impact on. It could be even strength, but it could be impacting the colonization by other organisms. And so, spatial spatial temporal um, interactions are really the, the frontiers of um, microbiome science. Well, and it's quantity as well, right? I mean, it's not just, it, it's sort of time, place, and then also, I guess, abundance is maybe not necessarily the way to think of it, but, you know, there, there, there are so many pr processes that have a, a threshold to them that has to be reached before it will happen, before whatever needs to happen is going to happen. Um, and that's really one of the, you know, getting the thing at the right time, do, doing it at the right time and in the right place, but then also making sure that there's the right amount or you know, exceeding or not exceeding whatever the threshold is, is really critical or keeping something at near close to threshold. Um, so I just, I think it's really abundance and understanding those sort of thresholds as well, tipping points, if you want to think of them that way. Yeah, and then exactly. And also think about then the biology of those organisms. 
because they may all have different yeah. times, you know, or they so may be able to just clone. I'm going to pick right up on that, Sharifa, because and I'm going to put words in James's mouth because I heard James talking about chemical handshakes um, that are what it takes to get partners together, right? So I think that understanding signaling is really important because if we provide the signal, people could get together even if they weren't the ones that originated the signal, right? So if we understand the signaling part, I think we really need to involve some chemical ecologists in this um, community building exercise. Um, and, and we have some of those here at Penn State. So that's how you throw a party, right? <laughs> Not everybody plans it, but they show up. <laughs> they get the signal. <laughs> right, they get the signal. Okay, so we, um, I, I think that we could adjourn um, with the panel and move on to our, our next growth phase, right? Okay, um, which James, sadly, you will not, you know, you will not be able to be physically here and, and all of you on Zoom. We are going to move into a poster session um, and a reception. Um, and so any, any last, or I think we're gonna make a few closing comments here um, and then move on into that next phase. Um, Zubeda, is there anything you'd like to communicate? Which is exactly what we started to do with this awesome panel now, right? We really wanted our discussions to be focused on how do we move forward as uh, multiple interdisciplinary teams. Um, what uh, Carolee was talking about uh, with um, uh, Monica Medina's effort, that's another uh, uh, outlet that I hadn't mentioned this morning, which is the uh, science and technology centers which are extremely inner and multidisciplinary. And that's something else we might wanna think about. And, and let's just um, thank our panelists before it gets too late here. Thank you very much. Thanks y'all. Thank you. Thanks James.